Tonight we will tell the truth about how pressing the climate and ecological emergency is and summarize the latest science on what risks there are in our current trajectory. We'll then give a roadmap for action we can take together and finish with a look into Extinction Rebellion Network. Grief is welcome here. Jen's already mentioned it briefly. We are sh what we're sharing here is about the danger that life on Earth is in. It can be hard to hear. And we honor you for coming and being willing, be willing to face this. Please take a moment to share with the person next to you what brought you here. Okay, when we start talking climate science, the IPCC is a good place to start. So the IPCC is a body of scientists and diplomats that provide governments with scientific information to develop climate policies. The IPCC has been around for a long time and they work through a lengthy process of consensus before they publish their reports. Their first five assessment reports were cautious and conservative due to this consensus process. In October last year, the IPCC changed their tone. They released a special report giving us 12 years to avoid climate change catastrophe. It was a shocking report for many people and received massive global news coverage. Some newspapers said 12 years until we're doomed. However, the scientific community has criticized this report and the previous ones for not expressing the true scale of climate change implications. The document was called incredibly conservative by Bob Ward of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change because it did not mention the likely rise in climate-driven refugees or the danger of tipping points that could push the world onto an irreversible path of extreme warming. What Lies Beneath was released last year as well to highlight the existential threat of climate risk. One of the many experts involved in this book, Professor Sheldon Hoover, who is the senior advisor of the Pope, Pope Francis and Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor and the EU as well, he says, climate change is now reaching the end game where very soon humanity must choose between taking unprecedented action or accepting that this has been left too late and bear the consequences. The issue is the very, the very survival of our civilization. So what is it that all these scientists are talking about? Let's dig more deeply into the physics behind temperature, tipping points and positive feedback loops. Climate change is often talked about as global warming. We are shown pictures of polar bears and melting icebergs. Closer to home we can look at the southern Alps and see shrinking snow cover. When we look at feedback loops, we see why this is so important. Ice regulates temperatures. When we change Earth's temperature, we're upsetting all the systems on Earth that support life. Uh, normally when you apply heat to a substance, its temperature will increase. This is not the case while a phase change is occurring like ice to water or water to steam. Applied to the Arctic, this means as long as there's ice, the heating energy from the sun and the atmosphere mostly just goes into melting the ice. The amount of energy to melt one kilo of ice, for example, is 80 kilocalories. Only once the entire kilo of ice has been melted will the temperature of the water rise. So once there's no ice in glass here or in the Arctic, the water temperature starts rising and if you apply the same amount of energy again that it took to melt that one kilo of ice, the temperature suddenly goes up all the way to 80 degrees Celsius, which is something that when I first learned about it really shocked me. Because if you apply that to the Arctic, it means the water temperature and the air temperature and the temperature of the whole system will skyrocket as soon as there's no more ice in the Arctic. One of the worrying feedbacks um, is called the ice albedo effect. As the white reflective sea ice melts, it's replaced by dark ocean, 
which absorbs more heat and in turn melts more ice. This is an example of the very worrying feedback loops involved in climate change that is directly contributing to the heating of the planet. The actual data on the melting of the Arctic sea ice suggests the Arctic will be ice free at the end of the summer, sometime in the next five years or so, could be next year, could be in five years. The linear graph in yellow doesn't fit, but you can see how it's going down. One of the most eminent climate scientists in the world, Peter Wattens, believes in an ice free Arctic could, as a, could add as much as 50% to the direct global heating effect of CO2. This is why people are calling it a climate emergency. We're facing a hothouse earth. Another 2018 paper uh, by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States addressed that threat of abrupt climate change. When changes happen very quickly and it becomes essentially in irreversible due to runaway effects. They studied 10 different feedback loops, including the Arctic sea ice and the albedo effect, which we've mentioned, but they also looked at permafrost thaw, release of frozen methane from the ocean floor, weakening of land and ocean carbon sinks, boreal forest dieback, reduction of northern hemisphere snow cover, and reduction of the Antarctic sea ice, to name a few. This graph shows increases in global average temperature since 1850. Currently, the global average temperature is already 1.1 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial baselines, and the temperature is rising at 0.17 degrees Celsius per decade. However, it's important to notice that this is not a linear increase anymore. In 2017, a paper by the University of Washington published that by 2100, so the end of the se century, we have only 1% chance of remaining within the Paris th target, which is 1.5 degrees Celsius. We only have a 5% chance that temperatures will be less than 2 degrees Celsius and the rise in global temperature is most likely to be between 2 and 5 degrees above the pre-industrial baseline. This means within the lifetime of young people today, we're heading towards catastrophic temperature rises. Global food security will be severely impacted. Crops will fail on a more regular basis. Many areas will cease to produce food at all due to flooding or desertification. Brings the question to mind, what happens to society when food prices spike? Who's got a one word answer? The Amazon will start to burn when global temperatures reach three degrees Celsius. The water in the Amazon will start to dry up and the rate of forest fires will increase. Forests will become net carbon producers, not the carbon sinks that they are today. Another issue that you've all heard of, I'm sure, is sea level rise. The rising temperatures cause melting of land ice in Greenland and in Antarctica, and uh, this is associated with sea level rise. This map shows the populations at risk of the resultant flooding. Many cities are based on rivers and on the coasts. Some will be submerged forever, others will sustain vast damage and destruction. A 2016 report identified 18,000 Christchurch properties as vulnerable to sea level rise. This compared to the 10,000 homes that were destroyed in the Christchurch earthquakes. By midline estimates, we're looking at a global sea level rise of several meters over the next 50 to 100 years. The World Bank, which is a conservative organization, suggests 140 million people could be on the move from climate change by 2050. And potentially 2 billion, that's one-fifth of the Earth's population by the end of the century. Where will people go? How will countries cope with massive inundations on, of climate refugees?
And there are other ecological pressures. Oceans, even more than forests, are the lungs of the Earth. They produce between 50 and 80 percent of the Earth's oxygen and consume more than a quarter of the planet's carbon dioxide, but this is reliant on a th thriving marine ecosystem. Known as the evil twin of global warming, ocean acidity has increased by about 30 percent and is set to increase by 150 percent till the end of the century. 20% of humans rely on marine life for nutrition. Some marine creatures like oxygen producing phytoplankton are unable to survive in a more acidic ocean and without them the marine food chain will collapse. Another issue mentioned here is pollution. Climate change and pollution are Inextricably linked, some types of air pollutants, for especially black carbon and methane, are among the top contributors to global warming after CO2. In the ocean, pesticide and fertilizer runoff are creating huge dead zones, oxygen depleted areas where many marine species struggle to survive. The world's largest dead zone located in the Gulf of Mexico is almost 23,000 square kilometers. That's roughly the size of Israel. Soil erosion. New Zealand loses soil 10 times faster than the rest of the world. Our mount mountainous terrain and mar maritime climate makes our hill country in particular more susceptible to erosion. But land management practices since the arrival of European settlers a century and a half ago have greatly exacerbated this sus susceptibility. Forest clearance, particularly on hill country, grazing on steep slopes, and overstocking are of unsuitable country have all accelerated erosion. <coughs> and deforestation and habitat loss are also massive blows to our planet's ability to regulate its temperature. Let's move on to the issue of extinction. There are five mass extinctions that scientists can see in the geological record. The last one that killed dinosaurs killed the dinosaurs was caused at least partly by an asteroid strike and the other four as you can see were caused by rapid increases in atmospheric CO2 triggered for example by huge volcanic eruptions. The most devastating extinction event to date was the Permian Triassic extinction in which 97 percent of all life was lost due to runaway feedback loops that led to gassing of the planet by methane. Their rate of CO2 emissions mirrors the rates that we can see today. So we know that human extinction is a possibility on our current trajectory. I briefly mentioned methane coming out of the permafrost and out of the Arctic seabed. This is a fairly common sight nowadays in the north where methane bubbles get trapped underneath the air and here you can see scientists basically setting one of them on fire and all this methane is just coming out of the Arctic Ocean. We have already entered the sixth mass, mass species extinction. Wildlife is dying out due to habitat destruction, overhunting, toxic pollution, invasion by exotic species and climate change. <coughs> Since 1970 we have lost 60 percent of all wildlife. Species endangered include one in four mammals, one in eight birds, one third of all amphibians and 70 percent of the world's assessed plants. Of the native species here in Aotearoa, around three quarters of fish, one third of invertebrates and one third of plants are threatened with or at risk of extinction. Jem Vendel, who is the Professor for Sustainability Leadership at the University of Cumbria in England, he took a year off work to have a close look at the, all the aspects of climate science. And out of this review came a paper last year called Deep Adaptation, in which he summarizes that animal and plant extinction is already happening on a vast scale. Societal collapse is inevitable and soon maybe in as little as three years. The massive loss of human life is very likely and human extinction is possible.
This should be on the news every night with discussions and stories about what's being tried to protect our children as if we were involved in a world war. In actual fact, our climate emergency is far worse than a world war. That's the end of the intense and scary science part of this talk. Before we move on to what can be done about it, I want to acknowledge the, Felix that the feelings that come with it. We've been talking about near-term global catastrophe that is truly big. I want to share some words from Dr. Kate Marvel, who researches humanity's effects on climate and what we can expect in the future. She says, the opposite of hope is not despair, it is grief. Even while resolving to limit the damage, we can mourn. And here, the sheer scale of the problem provides a perverse comfort. We're all in this together. The, Swiss, the swiftness of the change, its scale and inevitability binds us into one. We need courage, not hope. Grief, after all, is the cost of being alive. We're all fated to lives, to live lives shot through with sadness and are not less, not worth less for it. Courage is the resolve to do well without the assurance of a happy ending. The first stage of grief is denial, and we're coming out of denial. It allows us to appreciate what we most deeply value in life. When we see a near future of catastrophe for us and our Fano, of ecological meltdown for life on Earth, then allowing ourselves to feel the grief and fear is a step that can be allowed, that can be followed by asking how we intend to respond. Some of us can find our role in the greater picture by honoring our ancestors who went before us and respecting and protecting those who come after us. Our perspective can shift to see how connected we are to the living world. Coming out of denial is a shift in consciousness, away from accumulating things and thinking of our needs in isolation. It's, it asks us to think about the role we play in an emergency response that is much bigger than us. It asks us to let go of privileges and make sacrifices as priorities shift. It asks us to step into service and be willing to do the things that might just make a difference. So what is the current political response to this emergency looking like? <laughs> Our government's response is a mixed bag. On one hand, the last year of government has seen some exciting action. In, two, in April 2018, they committed to no new offshore gas and oil exploration. <laughs> this is great, apart from the fact that current permits don't expire until 2050. <laughs> Under Labour's coalition with New Zealand First, if the agricultural sector is introduced to the emissions trading scheme, it'll be given a 95% free allocation, not a great incentive to reduce the 49% of the country's total emissions that come from agriculture. The billion dollar Taranaki Eight Rivers Urea plant that has been celebrated as a climate solution both continues to justify gas exploration as well as supporting ecologically harmful farming practices that rely on urea farming. In a similar vein, the Billion Trees program is a step in the right direction, but on that, in part, continues to expand the pine plantation industry, eroding topsoil, increasing drought and flood risks while releasing stored carbon, and polluting waterways with fertilizer runoff. These examples show that while the government may have good intentions, we need to push, we need a push for localized, deeply democratic solutions that currently don't even feature in their agendas. A lot of what was once alternative is now ready to become the norm, having proven effectiveness in ecological protection and supporting local economies. These may include sustainably mixed forestry, regenerative diversified agriculture, community-owned power schemes, for example, wind or micro-hydro, land trusts, eco-tourism, circular economy design. These aren't one-size-fits-all solutions and so require a government willing to work with communities 
to bring in ecological practices appropriate to their needs and locations. That's courageous and visionary politics. How does the world manage to carry on with business as usual? In international climate conferences, countries make long-term targets which can only be achieved by relying on negative emission technologies. Uh, the one that's mentioned most often is called BECS, which stands for Bioenergy and Carbon Capture and Storage. For that, you grow trees and plants which suck CO2 out of the atmosphere as they grow. Then you chop them down and transport them around the world to be burned in power stations, capturing the CO2, which, then, which you then liquefy and pump through pipelines a few hundred kilometers away where it is stored underground, under pressure, and will hopefully stay there for a few thousand years. That's what we're relying on in every single model advising governments. BEX is extremely expensive and cripplingly inefficient and has never worked at scale anywhere in the world. Yet the IPCC mitigation group advises policymakers around the globe to decrease their emissions minimally and offload the burden to the next generation who are supposed to invent the technology to suck incredible amounts of CO2 out of the future atmosphere. In 1990, the UN warned that climate change was happening and stated that if we do not keep global temperature increases below one Celsius, then there would be a societal collapse across the world. Since then, carbon emissions have increased by 60% and we're now at closer to 1.2 degrees Celsius. You can see how the graph is not even indented you would think, since everyone's advising to do something, they would change, but nothing. It's like chasing a ball down the hill. At one point, it just becomes too fast to catch it. Coming back to deep adaptation, a map for navigating climate tragedy, Dr. Jem Bendel outlines three key steps. Resilience, <coughs> which includes the restoration of wetlands, seaweed farming, holistic grazing, no-till methods of horticulture to rebuild soils, and successful conservation of marine reserves and forests. Secondarily, relinquishment, retreating from the coast and the lowlands, conversion of animal agriculture to biodiverse cropping systems, closing climate-exposed industrial facilities, planning for food rationing, letting landscapes return to their natural state. And thirdly, restoration. So cultural shifts, including giving up expectation for certain types of consumption and learning to rely more on the people around us. In World War II, the American economy was transformed in a matter of a few months to deal with the existential threat for its population that the war brought about. A World War II style mobilization declaring us in a state of climate emergency and passing swift and transformative policies which reach everything from how we deal with household sewage to infrastructure and agricultural practices is necessary in order to minimize ecological, ecological catastrophe as well as adapt to what's coming. How does climate change affect the communities and places that we most deeply value. Many of us are motivated to be here not because we think we can save the planet. It might be too late for that. It's about doing the right thing. I would like to take one minute to ask ourselves, what does it mean for me to be a good human? What does it mean to die without regrets? Will I be able to look my grandchildren in the eye and say I did the best I could? So now what? Do we muster forces underground and march on the CEO of oil and gas companies with laser guns? Or hide away in the mountains and survive on bracken root and bellbirds? <laughs> We've mentioned strategies like deep adaptation. Humans know how to make solar, hydro and wind generators. We know how to make bicycles, electric transport systems and sustainable buildings. We know how to farm 
in a way that restores the soil ra fertility rather than eroding it. And we know diversity gives a system resilience to change. It's not to say that the solutions are easy, but we already have the technologies, the creativity and the ingenuity to move forward. Mitigation losses, planning as, we be as best as we can, embracing the possibilities we still have and learning to do without the ones we are losing. So how do we get the world on board with this? Approaches to tackling community issues involve awareness raising, for example, leafletting, lobbying, for example, sending emails to your MP, one day marches and writing petitions. These approaches make sense for smaller political issues like an unwanted housing development, but we're long past that stage. From an analytical and ethically responsible standpoint, we draw from social science and history to decide how to maximize our efforts to get governments to listen to us. Currently, the best strategy we have is nonviolent civil disobedience. Civil resistance allows people of all different levels of physical ability to participate, including the elderly, people with disabilities, children, and virtually anyone else who wants to. If you think about it, everyone is born with an equal physical, physical ability to resist nonviolently. Anyone who has kids knows how hard it is to pick up a child who simply doesn't want to move or to feed a child who simply doesn't want to eat. From the mid-50s, the civil disobedience direct action campaigns of Martin Luther King and the American Black Civil Rights Movement brought about significant changes in policy through campaigns that involved several hundred people going to prison and several thousand arrests. The Freedom Riders were black and white people who went on buses into the southern parts of the United States to break the bus segregation policy. It started with just 25 students and ended with around 300 people in prison by the end of the summer. This caused a fundamental change in policy. Here in Aotearoa, we have an incredible history of direct action beginning in 1881 with the nonviolent resistance of several thousand Maori against 1,600 troops when they marched on Parihaka, inspiring Gandhi's movement of peaceful protest. We were the first country to give all women the right to vote and the first to go nuclear free. But notice how all these photos are black and white. We are proud of civil disobedience once it's set in history. Let us honor how powerful our nation's journey towards justice and equality has been. And let us rise with courage and tenacity that we can recount to our grandchildren in the next stage of our history. So to Extinction Rebellion. Extinction Rebellion was born in England last year in October and has already made fantastic progress with the, with the cities in in the UK, like London and Bristol and many others declaring climate emergency as a result of their actions. On the photo you can see their biggest protests which happened in November where 6,000 protesters blocked five bridges in central London. The Extinction Rebellion demands are that the governments must tell the truth about the climate and wider ecological emergency and they must reverse inconsistent policies and work alongside the media to communicate with citizens. Secondly, the government must enact legally binding policy measures to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2025 and to reduce consumption levels. And thirdly, a national citizens assembly to oversee the changes as part of creating a democracy fit for purpose. We are a non-violent network Nonviolence is the most effective way to bring about political change. Creating a culture which is healthy, resilient and adaptable. It's a very important re regenerative culture. Extinction Rebellion focuses energy not just on direct actions, but also on support, capacity building and fun to give rebels the soul food they need. In Autotahi, we are passionate about this model which not only turns the work into fun and the group into friends, but is also practicing our intentions for the system we want to develop at all levels of society. We are based on autonomy and decentralization. In our own group, we have no set leader, 
Decision making is distributed through self-organizing teams. One of the key aims of Extinction Rebellion is to shift the Overton window. The Overton window is a concept of what is seen as normal and acceptable, part of the mainstream of public discussion of issues. The debate in the popular press about climate change tends to be limited to the fact that it will be of substantial cost. Disruptive and unexpected behavior can change the Overton window. For example, Donald Trump has managed to move the Overton window to a place where upfront racism becomes normalized, whereas a few years ago we couldn't have imagined the US president doing things like caging children and trying to ban Muslims. So Extinction Rebellion is trying to get people to talk about the possibility of human extinction. It needs to be normalized. According to researchers in nonviolent civil resistance, it turns out you only need to mobilize 1 to 3% of the population to bring about massive social change. Building on this, Roger Hallam, one of the famous faces of Extinction Rebellion London, who has a PhD in effective radical campaign design, outlines, outlines some ways to maximize impact even further. He says, if it takes one million people in the streets to get government to change, that is equivalent of only 5,000 people in getting arrested or about 500 people getting jail sentences. People's willingness to go to jail and to sacrifice for the cause is what makes ob observers sympathetic. Humans are affected by feelings more than arguments. So when people see how serious you are about a cause, it wakes them up. That said, even for one person to go to jail, there needs to be a large number of support people doing other important jobs. So not only is there plenty of room for people who don't want to get arrested, but those support people are essential to the group actually working. After watching a version of this talk here in November, in this room, a group began to meet every week. In December, we decided to launch ourselves by declaring rebellion against ECAN. We turned off their water supply and blocked access to the valve for over four hours and got great national media coverage. It needs everyone. It needs artists, writers, thinkers, Musicians, secretaries, researchers, gardeners, stencilers, editors, it needs everyone. We're a very young group and we're still in the process of self-organization and figuring out what we want to be. The action we did against ECAN came together very quickly and we do not have a concrete plan for the next step. But we know we want to f do a follow-up action very soon. Leading up to that, we're offering nonviolent direct action training and in the meantime, we want to work on upskilling ourselves and organizing ourselves into more effective groups. Extinction Rebellion needs people who can pump time and energy into figuring out creative strategies. It needs people who are really busy with their family, their studies, their career, or their projects, but still can occasionally come out in support. The rebellion is for everyone, all ages. That's where you can find all the slides, all the information summarized. Thank you very much for coming.